Hello, this is George Reisman, speaking to you in 2004. My lecture series, Essentials of Capitalism, which you will presently hear, was originally delivered in August of 1983 at the first Jefferson School Summer Conference called The Intellectual Foundations of a Free Society. The conference was held on the campus of the University of California at San Diego. The lectures at that conference were not recorded, and my series is being recorded now for the first time. Unfortunately, without benefit of an audience, and thus without any question and answer periods. The series consists of eight lectures, of approximately an hour each. The description of the series read as follows, quote, This course will explain the leading economic institutions of a capitalist society in terms of their nature, origin, functioning, and mutual interconnection. Among the subjects to be discussed are rational self-interest, economic freedom and limited government, private property, saving and capital accumulation, exchange and money, the division of labor, economic competition, and economic inequality, the profit motive and the price system, economic progress, and the nature of productive activity. Numerous popular misconceptions will be refuted and all of capitalism's institutions will be shown to promote the life and well-being of everyone." End quote. The series was a draft of major portions of what later became Chapter 9, substantial portions of Chapters 4 and 5, and a portion of Chapter 1 of my book, Capitalism, A Treatise on Economics. In the series, I sometimes make reference to my earlier book, the Government Against the Economy. Please note that that book has been incorporated in capitalism as chapters 6 through 8. For the record, I'd like to note that in one or two instances, I've made revisions in the lectures to correspond with the more advanced knowledge I developed by the time I wrote Capitalism. And now, let me proceed to Lecture 1, just as I delivered it in 1983. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The subject of my series of lectures is the institutions and functioning of capitalism. I want immediately to relate my subject matter to the broader subject matter of this conference as a whole, the intellectual foundations of a free society. Forgive me if at the outset I repeat some points of political philosophy that by now many of you must know in your sleep. Freedom is the absence of the initiation of physical force, including fraud. A society is free insofar as its members are free from the initiation of physical force. A free society possesses a government whose function is to protect the individual from the initiation of physical force by other private individuals and by foreign governments. At the same time, the government of a free society is strictly limited to these functions of defense. It is limited by such means as an established constitution, a bill of rights, and a division of powers. Thus, the citizen of a free society is free in relation to other private citizens, in relation to foreign governments, and above all, in relation to his own government. His government secures his freedom in relation to everyone else and is prohibited from itself violating it. Now what do individuals do if they possess freedom and at the same time are rational enough to desire to improve their lives and material well-being? Please note, I'm taking rationality for granted. Actually, its existence and that of freedom as well depends on the philosophical convictions people hold but this you can learn far more about from Professor Peacock than from me. And so I will simply take the existence of freedom and rationality as my starting point. And now I will tell you what people do if they are free and rational enough to want to better their lives and improve their material well-being. And that is, they spontaneously set about establishing all the other institutions besides freedom and rationality that constitute a capitalist economic system. They appropriate previously unowned land from nature and make it into private property. 
being secure in their possession of property from violent appropriation by others, and rational enough to act on the basis of long-range considerations, they save and accumulate capital, which increases their ability to produce and consume in the future. They also perceive the advantages of performing exchanges with others and of establishing division of labor. They perceive the advantages of indirect exchange, that is, of accepting goods not because they want them themselves, but because others want them, and the goods can thus be used as means of further exchanges. Out of indirect exchange, money develops, with the result that the division of labor is enabled to radically intensify, to the point where each individual finds it to his interest to produce or help to produce just one, or at most a very few things, for which he has paid money that he in turn uses to buy from others practically all that he himself consumes. In the context of a division of labor monetary economy, the individual's pursuit of his material self-interest gives rise to the principle of financial self-interest, the profit motive for short, that is, of preferring other things equal to buy at lower prices and to earn a higher income. In a monetary economy, these are the ways to increase the goods one can obtain. The individual's pursuit of self-interest also gives rise to economic inequality, as those who are more intelligent and ambitious outstrip those who are less intelligent and ambitious, and to economic competition, as different sellers seek to sell to the same customers and as different buyers seek to buy one and the same supply of a good or service. The combination of the profit motive and the freedom of competition, in turn, constitutes the basis of the price system and all its laws of price determination, as I explain in my book, The Government Against the Economy, Interjection, and in chapters 6 through 8 of Capitalism. Thus, rationality and the individual's freedom to act on the basis of it underlie private property, saving and capital accumulation, the division of labor, exchange and money, the profit motive, economic inequality and economic competition, and the price system. In a word, the whole range of capitalism's economic institutions. Now, the effect of these institutions, as they develop and thereafter, is economic progress. That is, the increase in the productive power of human labor and the consequent enjoyment of rising standards of living. Economic progress is the natural accompaniment of rationality and the freedom to act on it. For the continued exercise of rationality creates a growing sum of knowledge both within the life of any given individual human being and from generation to generation. This, together with the profit motive, the freedom of competition, the incentive to save and accumulate capital, and the existence of a division of labor society, is the essential basis of continuous economic progress. Economic progress is the leading manifestation of yet another institutional feature of capitalism the harmony of the rational self-interests of all the individuals who participate in the system. The basis of capitalism's harmony of interests is its freedom. Under freedom, no one may use force to obtain the cooperation of others. He must obtain their cooperation voluntarily. To do this, he must show them how cooperation is to their self-interest as well as to his own. To find customers or workers and suppliers, he must show how dealing with him benefits them as well as himself. As I will soon demonstrate, the gains from the division of labor make the existence of situations of mutual benefit omnipresent under capitalism. And economic progress spells increasing benefits for everyone. The institutions of capitalism and the economic progress that results represent the consistent implementation of man's right to life, as that right is described by Ayn Rand. 
namely the right, quote, to take all the actions required by the nature of a rational being for the support, the furtherance, the fulfillment, and the enjoyment of his own life, end quote. Capitalism is the economic system that develops insofar as people are free to exercise their right to life and choose to exercise it. Its institutions represent a self-expanded power of human reason to serve human life. The growing abundance of goods that results is the material means by which people further fulfill and enjoy their lives. To sum all this up, capitalism is the economic system of a free society. It is the economic system people achieve if they have freedom and are rational enough to use it to benefit themselves. Now I think it should be obvious that the intellectual foundations of a free society must include a widespread understanding of the nature and functioning of capitalism. Unfortunately, such understanding is not and never has been present, and the result has been a chronic and growing threat to the ability of a free society to survive. Consider how capitalism is viewed by large numbers of people whose beliefs go virtually unchallenged by the educational system and the media, indeed are inculcated and reinforced by the educational system and the media. Thus freedom under capitalism is ridiculed as the freedom to starve and as wage slavery. Private property is condemned as theft from a patrimony allegedly given to the human race as a whole. Money is denounced as the root of all evil, and the division of labor as the cause of one-sided development, narrowness, and alienation. The profit motive is attacked as the cause of starvation wages, exhausting hours, sweatshops, and child labor, and of monopolies, inflation, depressions, wars, imperialism, and racism. It is also blamed for poisoned foods, dangerous drugs and automobiles, unsafe buildings and workplaces, planned obsolescence, pornography, prostitution, alcoholism, narcotics abuse, and crime. Saving is condemned as hoarding, competition as the law of the jungle, and economic inequality as the basis of class warfare. The price system and the harmony of interests are almost completely unheard of, while economic progress is held to be a ravaging of the planet. Economic progress in the form of improvements in efficiency is also held to be a cause of unemployment and depressions. By the same token, wars and destruction are regarded as sources of prosperity. Practically all economic activity, beyond that of manual labor, employed in the direct production of goods, is widely perceived as parasitical. Thus, businessmen and capitalists are denounced as exploiters and as recipients of unearned income. The stock and commodity markets are characterized as gambling casinos, retailers and wholesalers as middlemen having no function but that of adding markups to the prices charged by farmers and manufacturers, and advertisers as inherently guilty of fraud the fraud of attempting to induce people to desire the goods capitalism showers on them, but which they allegedly have no natural or legitimate basis for desiring. Yes, capitalism is simultaneously denounced for impoverishing the masses and for providing them with affluence, for being a class society and for being dominated by the upstart nouveau riche, for its competition and its lack of competition, for its militarism and for its pacifism, for its atheism and its support of religion, for its oppression of women and for destroying the family by making women financially independent. Overall, capitalism is denounced as an anarchy of production, a chaos ruled by exploiters, robber barons, and profiteers who coldly, calculatingly, heartlessly, and greedily consume the efforts and destroy the lives of the broad masses of average, innocent people. On the basis of all of these beliefs, people turn to the government for, ju for social justice, for protection and aid in the form of labor and social legislation, for reason and order in the form of government planning. They demand, and for the most part have long ago received, progressive income and inheritance taxation, minimum wage and maximum hours laws, laws giving special privileges and immunities to labor unions, antitrust legislation, social security legislation, public education, public housing, socialized medicine, nationalized or municipalized post offices, utilities, railroads, subways, and bus lines, subsidies for farmers, shippers, manufacturers, borrowers, lenders, the unemployed, students, tenants, and the needy and allegedly needy of every description.
People have demanded and obtained food and drug regulations, building codes and zoning laws, occupational health and safety legislation, product safety legislation, and more. They have demanded and obtained the creation of additional money and the abolition of every vestige of the gold standard to make possible the inflation of the money supply without limit. They have demanded this in the belief that the additional spending the additional money makes possible is the means of maintaining or achieving full employment, and in the belief that creating money is a means of creating capital for lending and thus of reducing interest rates. The ability to create money has also been demanded because it is vital in enabling additional government expenditures to be financed by means of budget deficits and thus in fostering the delusion that the government can provide benefits for which the citizens do not pay. And when, as is inevitable, the policy of inflation results in rising prices, capital decumulation, and the destruction of credit, people demand price and wage controls. And then, in response to the shortages and chaos that result, the government's total control over the economic system in the form of rationing and allocations. In the face of such ideas and demands that are present with the force of a great flood, traditional American values of individual rights and limited government have appeared trivial and antiquated, appropriate perhaps to an age of independent farmers, but by no means to be permitted to stand in the way of what a frightened and angry mass of people perceive as the requirements virtually of their self-preservation. And insofar as the concept of individual rights has not been dismissed as a mere arbitrary assertion, it has itself been made over into a vehicle serving demands for government handouts and extensions of government power, in such forms as the assertion of rights to jobs, housing, education, pensions, medical care, and so on. Now, there is simply no way that a free society can survive when its corollary, capitalism, is feared and hated in this way. There is no way to salvage political freedom and civil rights if one gives up the case for economic freedom and property rights, as the so-called liberals in this country did early in this century. Practically all of what we think of as political freedoms and civil rights are inseparable from economic freedoms and property rights. For example, the freedom of speech is included in a farmer's right to use his land as he sees fit. His property rights include the right to invite people onto his land to hear a speech. The freedom of press is included in the property rights of the owner of a newspaper to use his type, presses, paper, and ink as he likes. This is all that is necessary to constitute the freedom of press. Similarly, the freedom of travel is the freedom to use one's car or shoes to go where one likes, or one's money to buy a plane or train ticket. Practically all violations of political freedoms and civil rights would simply be impossible if property rights were consistently respected. There is no way to violate the freedom of speech, press, travel, or virtually any other freedom if one respects the property rights that are involved. I must point out that, by the same token, the general hostility to economic freedom and property rights has already entailed a serious loss of political freedom and civil rights in this country, a loss that most people are unaware of, but which is nonetheless real. Thus, we do not have freedom of speech in radio or television because the government owns the airwaves. As a result, it is able to intimidate the stations by means of an implicit threat not to renew their licenses. Our freedom of the press is seriously impaired because newspapers and publishing houses are subject to the income tax, the antitrust laws, the National Labor Relations Act, and so on, all of which makes them more or less dependent on maintaining the goodwill of government officials. The limitations on contributions to political campaigns constitute a violation of the freedom of elections, since people are thereby restricted in their efforts to promote the candidates of their choice. And we have also seen a serious violation of the internal freedom of travel in the form of price controls on gasoline and consequent shortages and government allocations of gasoline. The relationship between political and economic freedom is a major subject in its own right, and I do not have the time to go further into it here. However, I would like to refer you to the government against the economy for a demonstration of how the total destruction of economic freedom as occurs under Marxism and National Socialism, implies the establishment of a totalitarian dictatorship. The perspective from which I want to approach capitalism in these lectures is that of economics. 
All of the criticisms of capitalism that I recited a few minutes ago were criticisms of its economic functioning. I want to define my approach more exactly. By an economic defense of capitalism, I mean something that goes far beyond a recitation of statistics or the drawing of such obvious comparisons between capitalism and socialism as that afforded by relatively capitalist West Germany versus socialist East Germany. Statistics and such historical comparisons have very little value by themselves. People are well aware of them and are never led to advocate capitalism on the basis of them. This is because they still believe, or at least do not know how to answer, the accusations against capitalism. Indeed, now that the statistical and historical case for capitalism in comparison with socialism has become undeniable and overwhelming, the conclusion that many people have drawn is that reason simply does not apply in this area. Their theoretical understanding makes them conclude that capitalism must be a disastrous failure and socialism a brilliant success. They are unable to reconcile their theory with the practice, have no awareness of an alternative theory or even the possibility of one, and end up discarding the whole realm of theory as such in this area. What is indispensable to the case for capitalism is a theoretical defense, an explanation in terms of principles of why capitalism does not and cannot behave as its critics charge, and does and must behave in a way that promotes the life and well-being of everyone. A place to begin this assignment, I believe, is with a detailed discussion of the division of labor and its relationship to the other institutions of capitalism. An understanding of these aspects of capitalism, I believe, represents an absolutely essential element of a sound social philosophy. It will make it possible to begin to see capitalism in its true light, as a system of social cooperation to the ever-increasing benefit of everyone. I now turn to this task. As I have indicated, a capitalist society is a division of labor society. Under capitalism, the division of labor intensifies to the point where the individual lives by devoting his working time to the production of just one, or at most, a very few things, all or almost all of which is consumed by others. By the same token, everything or almost everything that the individual himself consumes is produced by others. In order for the division of labor to intensify in this way, it must extend far beyond the narrow confines of a family, village, or tribe to society at large. It must begin to embrace the entire population of the world. The polar opposite of a division of labor society is the imaginary figure of Robinson Crusoe on a desert island. Its virtual opposite is the hundreds of millions of farm families in Asia, Africa, and Latin America who live in virtual self-sufficiency, producing almost entirely for their own consumption and consuming very little that is produced by others. A division of labor society is an indispensable precondition for a high and rising productivity of labor. The productivity of labor, by the way, is simply the output per unit of labor. It increases when the same amount of labor is able to produce more goods or better goods. The division of labor, and thus a division of labor society, raises the productivity of labor in six major ways, which between them represent a radical increase in the efficiency with which man is able to apply his mind, his body, and his nature-given environment to production. I will name them all now and then explain them one by one. One, it creates a multiplication of the amount of knowledge used in production, a multiplication that corresponds to the number of distinct specializations and subspecializations of employment. This makes feasible the production of products and the adoption of methods of production that would otherwise be impossible. Two, it makes it possible for geniuses to specialize in science, invention, and the organization and direction of the productive activity of others, thereby further and progressively increasing the knowledge that is used in production. Three, it enables individuals at all levels of ability to concentrate on the kind of work for which they are best suited on the basis of differences in their intellectual and bodily endowments. Four, it enables the various regions of the world to concentrate on producing the crops and minerals for which they are best suited on the basis of differing conditions of climate and geology. 
5. It increases the efficiency of the processes of learning and motion that are entailed in production. 6. It underlies the use of machinery in production. In order to understand how the division of labor represents a multiplication of the knowledge used in production, it is only necessary to realize that in a division of labor society such as our own, there are as many distinct bodies of knowledge used in production as there are distinct specializations and subspecializations of employment. Steel producers, for example, have a different body of knowledge than auto producers. Wheat farmers have a different body of knowledge than steel or auto producers, and even than dairy farmers or vegetable growers. The bodies of knowledge of all such specializations enter into the process of production in a division of labor society. And each individual is enabled to obtain products reflecting the total of such knowledge. Thus, steel producers give the benefit of their knowledge to the whole rest of society. In return, they are able to receive from the rest of society the benefit of the specialized knowledge held by all other categories of producers. And so it is with the members of every specialization. This is a result of enormous importance, whose significance needs to be pondered a moment. What a division of labor society represents is the organization of the same total sum of human brain power in a way that enables it to store and use vastly more knowledge than would otherwise be possible. To fully grasp this point, we must consider the contrasting case of a non-division of labor society, such as exists in most of Asia, Africa, and Latin America. In those areas where the overwhelming majority of people live as virtually self-sufficient farmers, each family knows essentially what all the others know about production. All know the rudiments of agriculture and the rudiments of making clothing and constructing shelter. But what this means is that the sum total of the knowledge used in production in such a society is essentially limited to what the brain of just one individual can hold. Any one farmer in those areas holds practically all of the knowledge that is used in production by hundreds of millions. To put it mildly, such a situation is a case of wasteful duplication. It is the wasteful duplication of the mental contents of the human brain, the wasteful use of man's ability to store and use knowledge. In this respect and in this sense, a division of labor society is indispensable to the efficient use of the human mind in production. In degree that production is divided into separate specializations with separate bodies of knowledge, the same total of human brain power is enabled to store and use more knowledge to the benefit of each and every individual who comprises the society. To say the same thing in different words, the division of labor represents the multiplication of the knowledge used in production. It multiplies such knowledge in degree that specializations and specialized bodies of knowledge exist and it multiplies correspondingly the benefits man is able to derive from the use of his mind. The enlarged body of knowledge that a division of labor society makes possible is the precondition for producing products and adopting methods of production that require more knowledge than any one person, family, village, or tribe can possess. To illustrate this fact and appreciate its importance, let us consider the amount of knowledge required to produce a relatively simple product, such as a ballpoint pen, that almost everyone uses practically every day in our society. In order to make it, starting from the very beginning, far more knowledge is required than is possessed by the direct producers of the pen. They may begin with a purchase of plastic, ink, pen points, and various types of machinery. What they know is how to produce such pens from that stage on but others must know how to produce the plastic, the ink, the points, and the equipment. Still others must know how to produce the petrochemicals from which the plastic comes, the various chemicals from which the ink is made, the metals from which the points are produced, and the components for the equipment. At further stages of remove, yet still others must know how to refine petroleum, how to explore for it, drill for it, and store and transport it, how to produce the drilling and refining equipment, the parts and materials to make that equipment, and so on. 
Tracing now the chemicals for the ink, the metals for the points, and the components for the pen making equipment further back, we are led into the chemical industry, the mining industry, and the machine tool industry. At practically all stages we encounter the construction industry that had to erect the various factories involved, the electric power industry that provides the factories and machines with light and power, and the transportation industry that moves the various products and means of production to where they are required. And these lead us back to the industries producing construction, electrical, and transportation equipment, and the industries producing the materials and equipment they require. We find that the production of a seemingly simple product, like a ballpoint pen, is not so simple after all. It is closely tied to the production of most of the rest of the economic system, in a virtual spider web of complexity, with threads running back and across to almost every other branch of industry, in ways that are too complex even to be completely and accurately named by anyone, let alone actually understood in the way required for production. This simple product is the result of vastly more knowledge applied to production than any one individual, family, village, or tribe could ever hope to acquire. A division of labor society is obviously indispensable for the production of all the wonderful products introduced over the last two centuries, from steam engines to rocket ships. By the same token, it is no less indispensable for the ability to use modern, efficient methods of production in making goods that can be produced in modest quantities with little or no division of labor. For example, being able to use tractors and chemical fertilizers to help produce wheat. Closely related to its multiplication of the knowledge used in production is the fact that the division of labor makes possible a radical and progressive increase in the benefit derived from the existence of geniuses. In the absence of a division of labor society, geniuses, along with everyone else, must pass their lives in producing their own food, clothing, and shelter, assuming they are lucky enough to have survived in the first place. Perhaps their high intelligence enables them to produce these goods somewhat more efficiently than other people, but their real potential is obviously lost, both to themselves and to all the rest of society. In contrast, in a division of labor society, geniuses are able to devote their time to science, invention, and the organization and direction of the productive activity of others. Instead of being lost in obscurity, they become the Newtons, the Edisons, and the Fords of the world, thereby incalculably raising the productivity of every member of the division of labor society. The effect of a division of labor society is thus not only to increase the total of knowledge that the same amount of human brain power can store and use, but to bring that knowledge up to a standard set by the most intelligent members of the society. The average and below average member of a division of labor society is enabled to produce on the strength of the intelligence of the most intelligent. Thus, in a division of labor society, people even of minimal intelligence are enabled to produce and obtain goods such as automobiles and television sets, goods which on their own they would not even have been able to imagine. And in each succeeding generation, geniuses are able to begin with the knowledge acquired by all the preceding generations and then make their own fresh contributions to knowledge. In this way, the knowledge and productive power of the division of labor society is able to progressively increase, reaching greater and greater heights as time goes on. In a division of labor society, not only productive geniuses, but everyone is enabled to concentrate on the kind of work for which he is best suited on the basis of his intellectual and bodily endowments. This principle applies to artistic and musical genius, to individuals with the kind of rare talents required to perform surgical operations, or to be a champion athlete, on down to people whose special advantage may consist merely of such attributes as the possession of relatively keen eyesight or relatively great physical strength. Just as in the case of productive geniuses, those with the potential ability to be great artists or musicians, great surgeons or athletes, or outstanding creators or performers of any kind, would not be able to realize their potential in the absence of a division of labor society. Because even if they managed to be born and reach adulthood, their time would be taken up with growing their own food and making their own clothing and shelter. In a division of labor society, on the other hand, such individuals can realize their potential, and all the rest of mankind gains from it. From being able to enjoy the art and music they create, from being able to live because of the operations they perform, and from being able to have the pleasure of watching the feats they accomplish. 
in a division of labor society, every productive advantage that individuals possess tends to be put to use and to raise the average productivity of labor. Imagine, for example, the case of just two people, Robinson Crusoe and Friday. Assume that Crusoe is particularly skillful in making bows and arrows, but not very skillful in using them in hunting. Assume that with Friday it's just the opposite. He is very skillful in hunting, but not particularly skillful in making bows and arrows. To make the case more concrete, imagine that it takes Crusoe one day to make a bow and arrows, and two days to catch and kill a deer. While Friday requires two days to make a bow and arrows, but only one day to catch and kill a deer. If the two men work independently of each other, without dividing labor, then in three days each will have made one bow and arrows and caught and killed one deer. Their combined output will be two bows and arrows and two deer. But if they divide labor with Crusoe concentrating on making bows and arrows and Friday on hunting, then in exactly the same time their combined output will be three bows and arrows and three deer, 50% more. For in three days Crusoe can produce three bows and arrows while Friday can catch and kill three deer. In a society of millions, hundreds of millions, or however many people, each person tends to concentrate on the specific things for which he is intellectually and physically best suited. And thus the production of everything tends to be carried on in the most efficient way it can be carried on in the circumstances. The production of everything tends to be carried on by those who can do it relatively best. A special aspect of individuals concentrating on what they do best is the more efficient utilization of land and natural resources. What an individual does best depends not only on his intellectual and bodily endowments, but also on the external conditions of nature that confront him. An individual living in a tropical climate, say, is able to grow tropical fruits or vegetables far more easily than someone living in a temperate climate, if the latter can grow them at all. An individual living close to rich deposits of iron ore, say, is able to mine such ore far more easily than someone not living close to such deposits, if the latter can mine or iron ore at all. Thus, a major aspect of the gains provided by the division of labor is that it raises the productivity of labor in the exploitation of land and natural resources. For what many people do best and are led to concentrate on is precisely the exploitation of advantages afforded them by climate and by their proximity to special types of land and natural resources. The result of specialization along these lines is that every geographical area can obtain products that depend on the special advantages of other areas. Each area that possesses special advantages concentrates on those advantages to some degree and produces more of the products in question than its own inhabitants consume. The difference is exchanged for the products of other areas which possess different advantages. The effect is that every area can obtain the benefit of the special advantages of every other area. Thus, the people of the whole United States can be supplied with iron ore from Minnesota, coal from Pennsylvania, oil from Texas, wheat from Kansas, corn from Iowa, and beef from Florida. And of course the gains are international. The whole world can benefit from Brazil's advantages in coffee growing, Saudi Arabia's oil deposits, and the advantages of the various American states that I just mentioned. Furthermore, the ability of each area to exploit its own advantages vitally depends on its incorporation into the division of labor system. For example, very little iron ore could be smelted without coal to provide fuel. By the same token, very little coal could be mined without iron and steel to make possible the production of the necessary equipment, and so on. The division of labor increases the efficiency of the processes of learning and motion that are entailed in production. First, under the division of labor, the individual who learns an occupation is able to apply his learning repeatedly because he devotes his full working time to that occupation. The effect of this repetition is that he becomes extremely proficient in the use of his knowledge. In effect, he subconsciously automatizes the knowledge. He learns it so well that he no longer has to think things out step by step as one does before one has the necessary experience or after one has been away from a field for a while. A worker who is constantly practiced in his work can obviously accomplish a lot more in the same time than one who is not. Outside the division of labor, on the other hand, even in cases in which people might be able to acquire sufficient knowledge to accomplish something, they would most likely not have sufficient occasion to use that knowledge to become proficient in its use. 
A good example of this, drawn from the context of our own society, is the case of a professional repairman and a do-it-yourself homeowner. A good professional plumber, for example, can usually spot the source of a plumbing problem very quickly, decide exactly what needs to be done, reach for the appropriate tools and supplies, and do it. The inexperienced homeowner, on the other hand, who tries to repair his own plumbing, must probably first read a book about how to do it, and then, assuming he has correctly diagnosed the problem and obtained all the necessary tools and supplies, fumble about trying to do it. Even if later on he needs to make the same repair again, the homeowner will probably experience many of his original difficulties, because probably so much time will have gone by that he will have forgotten much of what he learned the first time he made the repair. This example illustrates the second way that the division of labor increases the efficiency of the learning process in connection with production. Namely, it increases the ratio of the time spent in using knowledge to the time spent in acquiring it. Our plumber spends a given amount of time learning how to make a given repair and then makes that repair over and over again. The homeowner spends a given amount of time learning how to make a given repair and then hardly ever uses the knowledge he has acquired. The learning time put in by the plumber is obviously much more fruitful. The same principle, of course, applies to all specialists versus non-specialists, and is the reason that it pays specialists to acquire vastly more knowledge about their work than it can ever pay non-specialists to acquire. Finally, the division of labor increases the efficiency of the learning process in connection with production by virtue of the fact that it makes education and communications, and indeed all the means of transmitting knowledge, into specializations. These, like all other specializations, also tend to be carried on by those best suited for them. In this way, the diffusion of knowledge of all kinds, including, of course, all that pertains to production, tends to become more efficient. Thus, the division of labor increases the degree to which knowledge of production is assimilated, and therefore the proficiency with which it is used the yield to the time spent in acquiring it, and the efficiency with which it is disseminated. These advantages, of course, are obviously closely related to the multiplication of knowledge that we discussed at the beginning of our investigation of how the division of labor raises the productivity of labor. The division of labor also achieves a major increase in production by means simply of eliminating unnecessary motion in production. The tendency under the division of labor is to concentrate work of the same type in the same place, and, depending on the volume of work that can be so concentrated, to break it down into the simplest possible steps, consisting of the smallest possible number of separate motions. For example, most factory-made products are produced under, a, under an arrangement whereby the typical worker remains in just one place and performs just one kind of operation in the course of his working day. Typically, he performs just one step in the making of just one component or part, or joins just one component or part to one other component or parts. The, advantage of such a system, the advantages of such a system are that it eliminates the time that would otherwise be lost in walking back and forth from one place to another to do different kinds of work, in constantly picking up and putting down different types of tools, and in constantly having to finish up and possibly clean up what one has been doing and warm up to what one is about to do. Repetitious factory work is a further and important example of the division of labor's enhancement of the yield to learning. It represents the yield to learning being raised so high that people can live by virtue of knowing merely how to perform a few simple operations. Under the division of labor, the intelligence of businessmen, capitalists, industrial engineers, and managers achieves the isolation, concentration, and coordination of small, distinct steps in production, which then constitute highly productive jobs for people even of very limited intelligence. Because of the productive efforts of the first group, highly sophisticated products, such as automobiles and even computers, can be produced by members of the second group, by people who could otherwise hardly even imagine such products, let alone produce them. Finally, the division of labor raises the productivity of labor by virtue of the fact that it underlies the use of machinery in production. It does so, first of all, by creating a sufficient fund of knowledge in a society to make the production of machinery possible. As I explained earlier in the discussion of the multiplication of knowledge, the division of labor is indispensable to the production of all products 
requiring the existence of an extensive body of knowledge, a body of knowledge greater than can be held by any one individual, family, or village or tribe. Virtually all machinery is in this category. The division of labor is no less indispensable to the existence of machinery in providing the extensive and widely scattered range of materials necessary for the production and use of most machines, such as iron, copper, lead, tin, leather, rubber, timber, coal, oil, and so on. In the absence of division of labor among the different regions of the world, it would be virtually impossible to obtain the materials required for the production and use of machines. In addition, also as explained earlier, the division of labor makes science and invention into specializations carried on by geniuses, which of course greatly facilitates the invention of machinery. And in reducing jobs wherever possible to a small number of distinct motions repeated over and over again, it enormously simplifies the problems of designing a machine or special tool to help do the work. As a result, machines and tools have frequently been invented by intelligent, ambitious workers who gave careful thought to the exact nature of the operations they performed every day, and who figured out how their work might be aided by the application of some special mechanical device or implement. Lastly, by virtue of concentrating a large volume of work of the same type in the same hands, the division of labor makes the use of machinery and specialized tools economically worthwhile. For example, it pays a plumber to acquire not only all kinds of knowledge about plumbing, but also all kinds of specialized plumbing tools that it would not pay a homeowner to acquire. In the same way, it pays a large-scale manufacturer to use all manner of machinery that it would not pay a small-scale manufacturer to use. This is because machinery and specialized tools are almost always expensive. If their use is to be economical, they must be used fairly often, so that their high cost can be spread over a large number of units of output. Where this is not possible, it is probably cheaper to produce by hand. In concentrating work of the same type, the division of labor operates to assure that the use of machinery pays. It increases the productive yield to specialized machinery just as it does to specialized knowledge, and so makes its acquisition and employment worthwhile. Thus, the division of labor increases the efficiency with which man is able to apply his mind, his body, and his nature-given environment to production. It expands his capacity to store and use knowledge, which knowledge it also raises to a standard set by the most intelligent members of society. This standard in turn tends to rise higher and higher in each succeeding generation, as creative geniuses again and again enlarge the stock of productive knowledge. The division of labor also increases the degree to which knowledge of production is assimilated, the yield to the time spent in acquiring it, and the efficiency with which it is disseminated. It increases the efficiency with which man applies his body to production, by enabling everyone to concentrate on whatever he is relatively best suited for by virtue of his bodily endowment, by eliminating unnecessary motion in production, and finally, by making possible the addition of machine and mechanical power to the power of human muscles. This last enables man to accomplish physical results that would otherwise simply be unthinkable. The division of labor increases the efficiency with which man applies his nature-given environment to production. It does so by the direct means of geographical specialization and even more by means of the use of ever-improved machinery and methods of production that flow from the heightened and progressively increasing efficiency that it lends to his use of his mind and body. On the basis of all these considerations, it should be obvious that a division of labor society is the form of society appropriate to man's nature and the nature of the world in which he lives. Man has been defined by Aristotle as the rational being. A division of labor society is necessary for man to use his rationality efficiently in production. It is necessary if he is to actualize the productive potential provided by his possession of reason. By the same token, the existence of a division of labor society is to the rational self-interest of every individual. The widely held notion that life in society requires the sacrifice of the individual's interests is totally mistaken in regard to it. That notion applies only to societies characterized by force and plunder, not to a division of labor society. A division of labor society represents the mutual cooperation of individuals for the purpose of achieving their own individual ends. 
The radical and progressive increase in the productivity of labor it brings about makes it possible for everyone to achieve his ends incalculably better within its framework than outside of it. It should be clearly understood that a division of labor society underlies modern material civilization. Without it, the airplanes, the automobiles, the electrical appliances, the farming equipment, the x-ray machines and operating rooms, the antibiotics and vaccines, modern hygiene and sanitation, all of it would simply vanish. And in the process, the vast majority of the world's present population would die of starvation or disease. There is not enough land in the world to feed anything approaching its present population with a sharp decline in yields per acre that would result from the loss of a division of labor society. The Western world would find itself reduced to the poverty of Africa and Asia, but with no outside sources of food or medicine to turn to. All over the world there would be famine, plague, and depopulation. The survivors of such a catastrophe and their heirs would live in the misery characteristic of a primitive economy, a short lifespan marked physically by hunger, exhaustion, and disease, and spiritually by illiteracy, ignorance, and fear. All this has major implications for ethics. It implies that the ethical principle of respect for the persons and property of others is not something that is arbitrarily enjoined upon us by an outside authority, but has a rational basis in the requirements of serving our own self-interests. In order for us to enjoy the benefits of the division of labor, each of us needs the existence of others, and for those others to be secure in their persons and property, and thus to be motivated and able to work and produce. It is thus to the individual's self-interest that others, as well as himself, be secure from such threats as murder, assault, and theft. And of course, a general respect for the rights of the individual as such serves to guarantee the rights of each specific individual. A division of labor society is not only something that exists in the interest of the individual, but it is formed and maintained by individuals seeking to serve their self-interests. For example, the radical intensification of the division of labor in the United States between 1790 and 1950 was the result of millions of farmers finding it to their self-interest to concentrate more and more on the production of crops for the market, and of millions of sons and daughters of farmers finding it to their self-interest to take jobs in towns and cities rather than remain on the farms. These self-interested choices of tens of millions of individuals is what built the division of labor society we know today. That society is maintained in each generation by individuals' judgments that they are better off working for money and buying what they want rather than attempting to revert to the self-sufficiency of their ancestors. Indeed, not only the division of labor itself, but all the institutions that support it are the product of individual self-interest as I have already indicated and will show further tomorrow. It should be obvious that in the name of the value of human life and well-being, a division of labor society is itself a cardinal value and should be upheld with all the means at our disposal. As will become increasingly clear, this means that a capitalist society is a cardinal value and should be upheld with all the means at our disposal. Despite this, indeed perhaps because of it, the division of labor has been attacked most notably by Marx and Engels. They blame the division of labor for making work boring and unpleasant, for alienating the worker from his work, and for making him narrow and one-sided rather than broad and well-rounded in his interests and capacities. Socialism, they boast, will abolish the division of labor and turn work into a pleasure. These accusations are nonsensical. Work in a routine factory job may well be boring and unpleasant for many people, Yet it is far less boring and unpleasant than the work of primitive farmers which preceded it, and which tens of millions of people in the Western world willingly fled from in order to take the factory jobs. Even now, large numbers of housewives consider it less boring than housewife, housework, which consists of a wide variety of boring jobs. A dull job performed for money is almost always less dull than one performed for the sake of a given physical result because the money at least can be exchanged for so many different things and thus ties the work to interesting possibilities. Furthermore, if full capitalism existed, even the otherwise most monotonous repetitious type of factory work would be given an important measure of challenge and excitement through the establishment of piecework. 
and competition among individual workers and assembly line teams. Under such conditions, work becomes perceived as the direct, immediate means of putting money in one's pocket. Workers then go at the dullest kinds of jobs with comparable enthusiasm to people pulling the handles of slot machines, but with the certainty of gaining a small jackpot each time. The charge that factory work is alienating rests on a view of the average factory worker as being incapable of intellectually understanding the importance of his particular work to the final product. It assumes that to take personal pride in his work, a worker has to be in the position of a medieval cobbler and oversee the process from raw material to finished product. It does not see that a worker can conceptually understand that, for example, the welds he performs help to keep an airplane in flight or an automobile in operation. It does not see that in a division of labor society, a worker can take pride in the fact that he contributes to the production of magnificent products whose operation would appear absolutely miraculous to any medieval cobbler. Finally, it is in a division of labor society that the average worker, for the first time in all of human history, has the opportunity of actually becoming something of a Renaissance man, if that is what he chooses to be. The division of labor has raised the productivity of labor so high that today the average member of a division of labor society has both substantial real wealth at his disposal and substantial leisure in which to enjoy it. It is no exaggeration whatever to say that today the average worker can easily afford an extensive personal library in paperback of books on science and philosophy. He can afford an extensive collection of fine musical recordings and prints of the greatest works of art. He has the leisure to engage in all manner of athletic activities, including year-round swimming if he lives in practically any large town or city. In short, he has opened to him in some substantial measure precisely the kind of life that the ancient Greeks thought could be enjoyed only by a slave-owning aristocracy. Further improvements in the productivity of labor under the division of labor will place still more wealth and leisure at the average worker's disposal. At the same time, the proportion of truly interesting and challenging jobs in the economic system has steadily increased with the progress of the division of labor and could continue to increase in the future. Today, a far larger proportion of the population than ever before works in the professions, in management, and in various mechanical and skilled trades that have sprung up and grown with the intensification of the division of labor. These jobs are in addition to those of the custom craftsmen that came into existence with the first revival of the division of labor in early modern times, and which the enemies of the division of labor like to contrast with factory work, forgetting that before the factories very few people held such jobs, and that the overwhelming majority were half-starving illiterate peasants. Computerization and automation, if allowed to proceed, will make possible substantial further improvements along these lines. Furthermore, the wealth and leisure that a division of labor society makes possible, the education and level of knowledge that the wealth and leisure in turn make possible, are powerful forces working against feelings of alienation. While it is true that alienation, a sense of lack of belonging and lack of control in one's life, is a growing symptom of modern life, it is not because of, but in spite of, the existence of the division of labor. The wealth the division of labor gives us gives us control over our physical circumstances. Our houses are not blown down by every strong wind. We do not starve when the rain does not fall or when the locusts come. We do not, as a common occurrence, see our children and loved ones, our friends and neighbors, dead or dying around us. We do not live in the constant fear of disaster, disease, and death. Yet that is the normal state of life in non-division of labor societies. By the same token, when a disaster does strike us from which we cannot escape, we are at least able to understand it as a natural phenomenon, and not as the visitation of the wrath of some mysterious power. Wealth and education are the physical and mental means of being in control of our lives, and therefore of not being alienated. Both depend on the productivity of a division of labor society. Marx and Engels were right about one thing, though. Socialism, if it comes, will abolish the division of labor. As I will begin to show tomorrow morning, the division of labor is both itself an institution of capitalism and the source of a profound influence on the operation of all of capitalism's other institutions. 
A division of labor society and a capitalist society are in fact virtually synonymous expressions. When the other institutions of capitalism are destroyed, the basis of a division of labor society is destroyed along with them. Thank you.